Welcome everyone. Here we will discuss a new chapter, biosignaling. In this chapter, we will discuss various signaling pathways that happens within a cell and also signaling between different cells. We will begin our discussion through general features of signal transduction. Then we will proceed to understand G protein coupled receptors and secondary messengers. We will then proceed to understand tyrosine receptor kinases or receptor tyrosine kinases and a cascade of kinase signaling that is involved in various different pathways. We will discuss gated ion channels and last but not least regulation of cell cycle by protein kinases and to be specific we will also discuss oncogenes tumor suppressor genes and programmed cell death what is signal transduction the ability of cells to receive signals from the environment beyond the plasma membrane and act upon these signals is fundamental to cellular life. For example, bacterial cells constantly receive input from membrane proteins that act as information receptors, sampling the surrounding medium for pH, osmotic strength and the availability of food. Now in case of eukaryotic cells, typical signals include antigens, hormones, or neurotransmitters. Not just these, but beyond these are various different signals. These are just examples. Now these signals cause changes in the cell's composition and function, such as cell differentiation and antibody production, or growth in size or strength, or cell division. In all these cases, the signal represent information that is detected by specific receptors on cells and converted to a cellular response, which is always a chemical process. So signals received by cellular receptors on cell surfaces and it is converted to a chemical process. Now this conversion of information in the form of signal into a chemical change is called as signal transduction. So basically converting any signals that the cell receptors receive and that is getting converted to chemical information so that it can be processed within cells. Receptors are biomolecules that are integral for cellular communication and signal transduction. Receptors interact with signals and translate message to the cell. A receptor can be a membrane bound or soluble protein or protein complex which exerts a physiological effect or an intrinsic effect after binding its natural ligand. Like I said, receptors are biomolecules and they can be proteins. And in this case, receptors can bind to a ligand. Now, what are the different kinds of receptors? G protein coupled receptors are one example. They are also called as epinephrine receptors. Enzyme linked receptors for example, insulin receptors. The reason why they are enzyme linked is because these receptors have enzymatic activity. Ligand gated ion channels or ligand gated ion channels. For example, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. These are classic examples of ligand gated ion channels. Other membrane receptors, such as integrin receptors. Nuclear receptors or steroid receptors as an example.
These are various different receptors within the cells. There are other receptors as well, but these are some of the commonly involved receptors in signal transduction pathways. As I said, receptors bind specific ligands. Typical ligands involve small ions, such as ferric ion, in case of bacterial ferric receptors, organic molecules, such as adrenaline, epinephrine receptor or G protein couple receptors that bind adrenaline. And adrenaline is a small molecule and it is an organic molecule. Polysaccharides, heparin is an example. Fibroblast growth factor is a receptor that binds heparin. Peptides, insulin is a classic example. Insulin receptors in cells recognize and bind insulin. Proteins, vascular endothelial growth factor is a classic example of a protein ligand. VEGF receptor binds proteins. Let us discuss some features of signal transducing systems. Signal transductions are remarkably specific and exquisitely sensitive. For example, specificity is achieved by precise molecular complementarity between the signal and receptor molecules. S1 is a signal for this receptor, whereas S2 is not. And because the receptor is specific for S1, it will only bind S1 and not S2. And only when S1 binds would the receptor elicit a signal response. Now this interaction between S1 and the receptor is mediated by the same kinds of non-covalent forces that mediate enzyme substrate and antigen antibody interactions. In eukaryotes or multicellular organisms, there is an additional level of specificity because the receptors for a given signal, for example, in this case, S1 is a signal for this receptor, or the intracellular target of a given signal pathway is only present in certain cell types. For example, if adrenaline alters glycogen metabolism in liver cells, it will not do so in fat cells. That's a classic example. Another feature of Signal transducing systems is amplification. Amplification results when an enzyme, as shown here, is activated by a signal receptor. And this is the signal, and as a result of this signal, a receptor activates an enzyme, and this enzyme in turn catalyzes the activation of many molecules of a second enzyme. And a second enzyme can be this, this, or this. Each of these second enzymes can activate many molecules of a third enzyme. So enzyme 3, as shown here, um, is many in number as compared to enzyme 2. This process is called as an enzyme cascade. Now, these cascades can produce amplification of several orders of magnitude within milliseconds. Hence, the response to a signal must be terminated such that the downstream effects of this signaling pathway is proportional to the strength of the original stimulus. And cells have systems to control such amplification cascades. Another feature of 
signal transducing systems is modularity. Interacting signaling proteins are modular. Many signaling proteins, as shown here, have multiple domains that recognize specific features in other proteins. For example, the green colored protein shown here recognizes a phosphate that is bound to another protein. Now, this modularity allows a cell to mix and match a set of signaling molecules to create a wide variety of multi-enzyme complexes. And as shown here, there are multiple proteins. And these proteins can be enzymes, and hence multi-enzyme complexes. One of the common theme in these interactions that is shown here is the binding of one modular signal. And if you consider this as one modular signal, uh, and this signal involves binding of this protein to the phosphorylated protein. Now, this interaction, as shown here, is regulated by the signal, and the signal is phosphorylation of this particular protein. And such a signaling cascade can also elicit response, and that is modularity. Another feature is desensitization or adaptation. The sensitivity of receptor systems is subject to modification. When a signal, as shown here, is present continuously, the receptor system becomes desensitized. Now, as a result of this desensitization, the signal is no longer present or the receptor no longer responds to the signal. When the stimulus falls below a certain threshold, the system again becomes sensitive. And that's how the desensitization or adaptation mechanism works. Another feature of signal transducing systems is signal integration. Signal integration is the ability of a system to receive multiple signals and produce a unique or unified response appropriate to the combined needs of the cell. You know, for example, there are two signals that are being received by two different receptors. Now, when these two signals have opposite effects, for example, one of the signal makes a receptor to increase the concentration of a second messenger or increase the membrane potential, whereas the second signal elicit a response by the receptor to decrease the second messenger or decrease the membrane potential. But because there is integration, the outcome of these two signaling pathways is the combined effect. So the net change in the concentration of second messenger or the net change in membrane potential would be the signal integration as a result of these two signals. And this would result in a response. And that is the integrated input from both receptors. A final noteworthy feature of signal transducing system is response localization within a cell or a localized response. When the components of a signaling system are confined to a specific subcellular structure, such as a raft in the plasma membrane. A cell can regulate a process locally without affecting distant region of the cell. And how does it do it? It introduces a message remover. For example, if a signal is um, 
interacting with a receptor which elicits a response and the message after the message is sent to a local uh, environment the message is then removed by a message remover and so the response is local and is not felt at distant sites in the cell so these are the various features of signal transducing systems and we'll look at examples of each of these signal transducing systems as we uh, go on before we look at some examples of these signal transducing systems it is important to understand and know that the affinity between a signal and a receptor is often expressed as the dissociation constant or KD and commonly a dissociation constant of 10 to the minus 7 molar or less means the receptor detects micromolar or nanomolar concentrations of a signal molecule and this is what this particular number means and this also means that the signal uh, is highly specific for the receptor and it's a strong binding so I just wanted to let you know that it is good to remember this particular concept because we will be talking about affinities in this chapter let us discuss the common membrane receptors these are the four general types of signal transducers G protein coupled receptor in this case an external ligand L binds to receptor R and as a result of this binding R activates a GTP binding protein G which regulates an enzyme that generates an intracellular second messenger in the second kind of membrane receptors these are called as tyrosine kinase receptors ligand binding L to a receptor activates this tyrosine kinase and this is an enzyme linked receptor which means that this receptor has an enzymatic activity and to be specific this particular receptor is a tyrosine kinase which means that it phosphorylates tyrosine residues in proteins and this performs this enzyme performs this reaction by autophosphorylation uh, which means that once it gets autophosphorylated it is active and it can phosphorylate other proteins and this initiates a kinase cascade and in this kinase cascade various kinases activate other proteins and a protein T when gets phosphorylated shuttles inside the nucleus and binds to other transcription factors to initiate gene expression the third case is a gated ion channel and in this case a ligand binds to an ion channel and as a result of this binding leads to transport of an ion within the cell now the channel opens or closes in response to the concentration of signal ligand or the membrane potential the fourth and the final case is a nuclear receptor hormone binding allows the receptor to regulate the expression of specific genes as shown here let us discuss G protein coupled receptor signaling G protein coupled receptors or GPCRs are alpha helical integral membrane proteins they're also called as guanosine nucleotide binding proteins and the reason is because GPCRs as shown here interact with 
guanosine nucleotide binding proteins and hence the name G-protein coupled receptors. G-proteins, the green colored blob, are heteromeric alpha, beta, gamma membrane associated proteins that bind guanosine triphosphate. G-proteins mediate signal transductions from GPCR proteins to other target proteins. For example, the adenylyl cyclase as shown here. Epinephrine or adrenaline interacts with the cell via a G-protein coupled receptor. Epinephrine is a hormone made in adrenal glands. Is a pair of organs on top of the kidneys. Epinephrine mediates stress response, for example, mobilization of energy. A fight or flight response is a classic example. Binding to receptors in muscle or liver cells induces breakdown of glycogen, and this is the function of epinephrine. Binding to receptors in Adipose cells or fat cells induces lipid hydrolysis. Binding to receptors in heart cells increases heart rate. The structure of epinephrine or adrenaline is shown here. Adrenaline also serves as a neurotransmitter in adrenergic neurons. The affinity of this compound to its receptor is expressed as a dissociation constant for the adrenergic neuron receptor ligand complex. Two other molecules are shown here. One of them and both of these are synthetic analogs of epinephrine. Isoproteinol is an agonist which means that this particular molecule has a higher binding as compared to epinephrine towards adrenergic neurons, whereas propranolol is an antagonist, which means it has extremely high affinity for the receptor. And because it has extremely high affinity, and that is given by the KD value, right? Because of this extremely high affinity, the binding of this particular compound to the receptor is really high and this is, will not dissociate from the receptor and hence it acts as an antagonist. So how is epinephrine sensed via a G protein coupled receptor? Epinephrine first binds to a specific receptor and this can be a beta adrenergic receptor. Once epinephrine binds, it initiates a conformational change on this GPCR, which in turn interacts with the G protein. And the hormone receptor complex causes the GDP bound to the GS alpha subunit of the G protein to be replaced by GTP. And as a result, GS alpha is activated in the presence of GTP. Now, once it is activated, GS alpha separates from the GS beta gamma complex. And remember, this GS beta gamma alpha is what the G protein complex is. And once GS alpha dissociates itself from GS beta gamma, it moves to adenylyl cyclase and activates it. Once adenylyl cyclase active, is activated, what it does is it catalyzes the conversion of ATP to what is called as CAMP or cyclic adenosine monophosphate. And cyclic adenosine monophosphate acts as a second messenger Cyclic adenosine monophosphates activate PKA and PKA is protein kinase A. It's another protein which 
initiates phosphorylation of cellular proteins and this causes a cellular response and so this is the response that is initiated by epinephrine binding to the beta adrenergic receptors. We will discuss in detail as to what this cellular response is as a result of pKa phosphorylation of other cellular proteins. In addition, CAMP is degraded, reversing the activation of pKa. And this is performed by CAMP phosphodiesterase. And this is one of the localized response that I was talking to you about. And um, in case of a requirement where the signal has to be dampened or uh, nullified, a CAMP phosphodiesterase is activated so that the CAMP signal is not uh, further transferred to other parts of the cells. CAMP or cyclic adenosine monophosphate is a secondary messenger. As you can see, adenosine triphosphate upon binding by adenyl cyclase cleaves a pyrophosphate bond and cyclizes adenosine monophosphate in this fashion. And this is a cyclic adenosine monophosphate. Now, when the CAMP phosphodiesterase cleaves CAMP, it just hydrolyzes so that it's no more cyclic adenosine monophosphate, but just adenosine monophosphate. Now, the function of CAMP is that it allosterically activates a variety of enzymes including CAMP dependent protein kinase A or PKA, the enzyme that I talked to you in the previous slide. PKA activation leads to activation of enzymes that release glucose from glycogen and this is a very important process.